This is a very special event, this Benjamin Eby Lecture. It was established in 1981 as a forum in which college faculty were able to present their research and creative ideas to this community. And what a rich feast of ideas and research we've had over the years. Just in recent years, for example, Lowell Ebert a few years ago talked about the law as both sword and shield. Laura Gray explored the music of Jean Sibelius and Glenn Gould. Marnie Epps spoke to us about Mennonite midwife healers. Nathan Funk described religious contributions to peacemaking. A year ago, I was privileged to speak to about Gandhi and Mennonites in India. Our research inspires and enriches our teaching. It's a foundation for our publications, and it animates many of our contributions to this community. And we're pleased to have this forum to share it with you. The Benjamin E.B. Lectures are also published in the Connery Graver Review. And if you're interested in reading past uh, lectures or this one, uh, check with us to get copies. And also, the, they're available on our website. In fact, the one that uh, Len did in that I'll speak about later, many, many years ago, it was available on our website. The program introduces you to Benjamin Eby. The lectures are named after this preacher, bishop, school teacher, farmer, author, editor, philanthropist. He was known for his generosity, for his humility, for his initiative, for his counsel. He shaped Mennonite life and the life of the wider community to such a large extent that for a few years this community was named Eby Town after this remarkable man. Now our faculty are also remarkable, even though the cities have not been named and renamed after them. <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce one of those remarkable faculty here tonight. Eby Lecture is nominated each year by a committee of college faculty and then confirmed by college council. So when I introduce Len Enns to you tonight, I want you to know that his colleagues are honoring him by inviting him to speak this evening. Len joined the college faculty in 1977. He had been a high school teacher at UMEI, United Mennonite Education Institute in Leamington, and had completed a master's degree in conducting, in, in choral conducting at Northwestern University. He later completed a PhD in music theory at Northwestern, analyzing the sacred choral music of Canadian composer Harry Summers. Len has been a teacher, a conductor, a composer, and a colleague at Grable and the University of Waterloo for 35 years. 35 years. He's been a full professor since 1999. He's taught conducting, music theory, jazz, composition, and for many years, a course in Canadian music. When asked about the strengths of his teaching, students say, his ability to help students improve, or his attitude. And some, when asked about the best parts of his teaching, say simply, Len Hans. <laughs> he personifies inspired teaching and mentoring relationships. Much of his teaching has been as a conductor. Conducting is, after all, a form of teaching. He conducted the university choir for several years. He created and led the chapel choir for many years, and with that choir produced six recordings between 1995 and 2009. He directed many concerts, and he led congregations in worship in more than 300 church visits during those years. David Martin, who's the executive minister of MCEC, Mennonite Church of Eastern Canada, wrote to express his appreciation for Len by, saying, by referring to Len's service in the church, his dedication to the music and ministry of the wider church. And he said, I want to communicate the appreciation of MCEC and the wider church for your years of work at the college and for the creative ways you have used to music to extend the peace of Christ. And in recent years, he's also conducted the University Chamber Choir. And of course, in this community, we know he's the founding director of the Decapo Chamber Choir, 
many of whom are here today. Since 1998, this choir has excelled in singing a repertoire chosen mostly from the past 100 years. Music that's challenging, evocative. Every concert, for those of us who attend as regularly as possible, brings surprises and delights. The choir has won several Canadian choral awards, including the 2010 Outstanding Choral Recording for their CD, Shadowland. At Grable, he's been an extraordinary colleague. He's always carried his share of and more of the music department and other college responsibilities. He was chair or acting chair of the music department for more than half of his years at the college, for 18 years. <coughs> He carried other formal and informal responsibilities. His music colleagues refer to him as the consummate and humble team player, who freely offers support to others, a rock of Gibraltar, as one put it. He's been a strong advocate of interdisciplinary cooperation and conversation within the college. And maybe the interdisciplinary conversation is why he likes puns so much. <laughs> He sees a different perspective on words. One of his former students asked me if we made punning part of the job qualification for his replacement. I said, no, we didn't. And I'll leave you to decide why. <laughs> Len's love of language and his respect for words as a poet was one of his very precious gifts to us as colleagues. At our regular college council meetings at the college, and that's the group of faculty and senior administrators, when we meet regularly, we ask somebody to provide an opening, or a center, you might call it. If it was Len's turn, he often read poetry, usually sparse, restrained poetry that allows air and silence to flow around it and to embrace it, like much of his music. He teaches, he conducts, and he composes music, as you all know. Music for instruments of all shapes and sizes and sounds, flutes, and oboes, harp, trumpet, piano, organ, cello, string bass, and saxophone, they're all part of the repertoire. And then music for the human voice, for soloists and choirs. And that music for the human voice, we experience his extraordinary ability to interweave the language of speech and music. As one reviewer expressed it, his music is complex, profound, reverent, and luminous. Many of his compositions were commissioned, then premiered and recorded by others. In 2010, he was a Juno, nominee, uh, Juno Award nominee for the Classical Composition of the Year for his Nocturne. In one month, He'll be in San Francisco and Santa Clara, California, where the Golden Gate Men's Course will premiere one of his compositions. And about 10 days later, Camarata Nova in Winnipeg will premiere his composition, Nun Danket Alle Gott, Now Thank We All Our God. Teacher, conductor, composer, and for many of us, colleague and friend. As I mentioned before, in 1984, at the fourth E.B. Lecture, Len Ince was the speaker. His title was Music, Intellect, and Emotion. Tonight he presents the 25th lecture in this series. His title is How Can I Keep From Singing? Well, if he keeps composing for us, and if he keeps leading us, we'll keep singing. Please welcome Len Ince. Actually, at uh, Nundank at All Our God. 
uh, and it's a bilingual uh, <laughs> take on, 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 on that. Um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you to the victims over in the corner here who will help later on a little bit. Uh, some of these folks are uh, members of the College Chamber Choir, some are members of the uh, Chamber Choir here at the University, uh, and I'm very good. I should also express my thanks to the college and to my colleague Jim for giving me a second chance to get things right with this lecture. <laughs> In that earlier lecture, which is music, semicolon, intellect, and emotion, I argue for the necessary linking of both mental and affective involvement in the best musical experiences. A basic position to which I will again return tonight. I will also rehearse arguments that have made in various settings over the past three decades and ask for your indulgence if this sounds all too familiar. If I'm bored tonight, I have no defense. The views that I held about music uh, as a newly minted faculty member here in the early 80s have really not fundamentally changed. But years of work as a conductor and composer in this laboratory, uh, this chapel is really my, it's not mine, but it's the laboratory in which I work very much uh, here in the congregational setting and in concert. I have turned these theories, those years of work, have turned these theories into convictions that I wish to share. And as documentation, I will draw from my work as conductor and composer, most of which will be presented here from commercial and archival concert recordings, but also some with living uh, people. <laughs> I was going to say in the description of the lecture that the only footnotes I will use are the kind that could be played by an organist, but <laughs> I didn't say <laughs> I'm sorry, this may sound boring, but is that music is an expressive art created by humans using <coughs> sound as a medium and time as a canvas. And that it requires listening as opposed to hearing and repeated, rewards repeated listenings with fuller appreciation. I don't think that things that don't reward repeated hearings with fuller appreciation fall into the category of really good music. I distinguish between hearing, being aware of a sound, and listening, being engaged with the sound and in the sound. And then just one other assumption. Um, I think there's a useful process, especially as we talk, as we consider education. And that is, I think I've got it on that sheet there. Going from like to understand <coughs> to appreciate. We like something, then the next step, which is kind of that boring step, is to learn to understand it. And then when you can bring those two together, uh, then there's, there can be a deeper and deeper appreciation. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, that's a very, very basic <coughs> simplification of, of an excellent article by Edward Cohn, uh, where he outlines three stages of, of, of this. <coughs> These stages are not necessarily sequential. <coughs> Engaged appreciation will develop over time in a zigzag way as repeated listening, study, and experience put liking, understanding, and appreciation into dialogue with each other. We might, for example, learn to understand the late Beethoven quartet, <coughs> and then learn to appreciate it in a deeper way, and then find out that we really like it. I mean, there, these, these things can work in various ways. They are all part of a rich whole. Still, I believe engaged appreciation is normally the result of all of, of, of the previous two. Many people like music, and it is meaningful to them in various and often profound ways. The task of education is to take students who like music to the second step of understanding it, obviously with varying degrees of success. Normally, the ultimate goal is an engaged appreciation of music as composer, performer, listener, teacher, um, professional for whom music is, is, is a necessity but not, not the bread-making activity. That will normally 
that will happen individually at the level of, of appreciation that cannot be taught. And then while appreciation can and should result from education, I believe strongly that the church and the concert hall also become rich settings for this development. And of course I'm reflecting that sort of three places in which my life has sort of defended itself uh, here as a teacher and, and working in, in those other two settings. So first of all, a little bit about music in education. I have in mind formal education in these comments, but I also intend them to be understood broadly and not to be restricted to the structured educational setting. <coughs> Well, there is significant flow through between education, worship, and concert. The place of music is distinct in each context. Education helps us understand music. Worship asks of all its elements, including music, music that they be servants to its prime purpose. And so the first question for worship in music is functional rather than aesthetic. The concert setting provides the richest context of all, ideally combining elements of education with spiritual and emotional engagement. I want to focus not on how music education is accomplished, but rather on the importance of music studies as part of education in general. This relates to curricular decisions at all levels of education and reflects the choices that have been made here at this college and have defined the kind of program that we have here. We all know this, the positive impact of music on cognitive development almost all development in almost all areas is well known and documented. Why do our classes here and our performing ensembles include some of the best students from all faculties of the university? I believe it is that folks like this are like this, not because they are so brilliant and therefore have all this extra time, but rather they're academically successful in a significant way because they study and perform music. The robust cognitive flexibility and stretch that music develops is a huge benefit to education in numerous ways. It is some of those benefits to education that I want to consider. First, in general, the study of music, as of the other performing arts, offers a particularly rich and holistic way of learning and a unique and profound way of knowing. Intellectual inquiry, physical training, and affective experience all work together in a unique way in music studies and serve as mutual enrichment. Performance training alone is best located, I believe, in a conservatory rather than a university. Academic studies alone in music history, theory, aesthetics, when totally separated from the context of music making, do an injustice to the very nature of the art itself. The educational significance of music as a discipline depends on its being both considered and experienced. The aspiration of music education is that the affective dimension, spiritual, emotional, and so on, be integrated with listening and performing in an informed way. This will then lead to and enhance true and engaged music appreciation. When mental, physical, and affective dimensions are involved, then music becomes a particular and powerful way both of learning and of knowing. I want to look at a few ways in which music education does this. First of all, music teaches us about ourselves. And other, other disciplines will do this in differing degrees, I think. But I think music is unique here, uh, at least uniquely potential. Music teaches us about ourselves and helps us to know ourselves and develop interpersonal sensibilities and so on. As singers in a choir setting, for example, music asks us to develop confidence in ourselves while also teaching us about our place in the larger ensemble, read social in the larger social setting. In the following example, listen to the way the individual parts make their contribution, but then also how they become subsumed into a collective sound, losing their unique identity while becoming part of a much richer whole. The example is from my composition to which Jim referred from Nocturne. The words are those 
of Lorenzo to Jessica in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Lorenzo says, here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears, soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Look how the floor of, this is the quote of this section I'll play for you. Look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patterns of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholds, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young eyed cherubim. And then he ends with this, which will not be part of the excerpt. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this mighty vesture of decay does grossly clothed in, we cannot hear it. My intention here was to create. Uh, first of all, I want you to listen to the individual, voice, individual voices and then as they become subsumed into a larger uh, whole. My intention was to create a kind of night sky, and the night sky might be more visible if you, you know, close your eyes and that helps you. Music can take us to a place 
where greed and aggression dissolve. Music can help chip away prejudices and make us mutually sensitive. Unfortunately, we have bad, humiliating, and insensitive examples in some of the patronizing arrangements that many of us <coughs> playing uh, in our younger years, I think, uh, I'm sorry, many of us, there are younger people <laughs> thinking here as a hoary old professor, um, saying in our younger years uh, arrangements of music from cultures other than ours. But we also have more and more composers who are working with humility and understanding to help develop a mutual embrace with global community through music. I want to play for you a particularly compelling example of this. This is the opening section of a piece called Color of Freedom by Iman Habibi, a young Iranian-Canadian composer. The composition is required and soloist. Habibi gives English words of Marina Nemat to the choir. Some of you will know the name. Nemat is a contemporary Canadian author who was imprisoned and tortured as a teenager in Tehran and may be familiar to some of you for her books Prisoner of Tehran and after Tehran. Habibi, the composer, gives Persian words of the 10th century mystic and poet Baba Tahir to a solo voice. In this performance, the Persian texts are sung by Amir Habibi, another Iranian-Canadian musician. The Dekapu Chamber Choir sings the English. I believe you have the text in your, in your handouts. Um, I'll, I'll read it quickly. The streets of, this is Nemat, the streets of Tehran cannot remember the color of freedom, for even the pavement of alleyways is crimson red. And then in Persian, this is the translation, this is the solos, my, solos, my sorrows plenty and my pains countless, alas, there is no remedy to my pain, O God. My companion doesn't know that my cries are involuntary. And then Nemat, Freedom is the color of water, and it dripped through our fingers till all that was left was thirst. But seeds of light remain in the depths of darkness and will grow when droplets of hope find their way through layers of cruelty. <laughs>
Music can bring global neighbors closer together, especially as we experience the commonality of our human condition, the pains we inflict on each other, the hope we can offer each other, and the joy we can share. When the intention is noble, music becomes peacemaking. Common music making can be a very unsettling activity for the war industry. I suppose the footnote comment here is that global music studies belong here at Grable, and I'm so pleased that at this half century mark, we are um, embarking seriously on, on that here. Third, think. Is music teaches us about relationships, about context, and about situation. A sound by itself is not, is not music, it's a sound. A sound by itself is, is nothing. It only becomes meaningful in relationship to other sounds. Further, the same note in different relational contexts has totally different meanings. Uh, let me give you the humble little note C. And, and it's our middle C, the most humble. It could be a very humble note. If we had this piece, the C was this little blip there, right? This is very humble. It, it could be a longing note. Okay. But you still hear how 
how we're developing one basic idea. One note has become a scale. Is that it? Okay? We're going to sing la la la. Now a little bit of the opening and the closing. But again, the point I'm trying to make is that we have with music the, 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 the a very good way to explore how how we can expand a very, a very simple idea. So that scale that I played, you'll hear at the beginning, <coughs> you'll hear those three chords, uh, and at the end the scale crawls back the other way. At the beginning, do I have the text there? Uh, do I? Yes? Okay. Um, uh, the words of the preacher, this big, big brash announcement at the beginning, the words, the king, the king in Jerusalem, and the words are vanity of vanities. Uh, second movement uh, is, there's nothing better to do than eat and drink and find enjoyment in our toil. It's pretty banal. And the third movement is, my soul waits as the watchman waits for the morning. Uh, so I'm just going to take the very beginning and the very end. The soloist, this is 1994, the soloist is Russell Braun. And it's the Kitchen Waterloo Philharmonic, conducted by Howard Dick.
piece that you gave the first one. And just, just the ending, which essentially is the inverse of it. This is the end of the third movement. The choir is saying, my soul waits, my soul waits. The soloist, this performance is 2004. Uh, the Phil did a repeat performance uh, in 2004. And the soloist here is, is Marcel Dugo.
transcends text. Well, we can argue that music is prelingual, both historically and developmentally. I mean, we've all heard babies humming and uh, so on. It is also beyond and above language in its ability to express and carry music. Combined with words in choral and soul compositions, music can extend nuance and elevate text and meaning. The acoustical alchemy of this art exists in the reach from semantic to spiritual meaning, from the physical to the transcendent. Music allows us to express the deepest joy, grief, longing, and fear when words alone will not do, or when we find it impossible to express ourselves in words. Examples of this are endless, but I want to give you one from the contemporary American composer Eric Whitaker. From his setting of the final verse of Samuel 18, David's expression of deep grief at the report of Absalom's death ends this terrible and tragic chapter. When David heard that Absalom was slain, he went up into his chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. That phrase, that last phrase, would God I had died for thee, comes after ten minutes of lament until Whitaker finally, finally gets there. Even on its own, of course, it's a powerful text, but listen to the way Whitaker deepens, uh, deepens the grief. We hear stunned grief, we hear shocked grief, uncontainable outpouring broken grief. You, I'm going to give you the opening three minutes of what will become a 15-minute lament um, uh, in, in Whitaker's hands. We read the text, it takes 20 seconds, maybe less. Living the meaning of that kind of text takes a lifetime. Whitaker's music takes us much closer to the real life meaning of the text than, than any alone can do. Uh, the composition is simply titled, When David Heard, and again, uh, the choir is the Zacapo Chamber Choir. Um, yeah, just in terms of filthy lucre and commercialism, uh, there, is, there is a CD table set up downstairs. <laughs> and, uh, should you want to avail yourself of this, uh, there it might be one. <laughs> So, this is the beginning of, of uh, Eric Whitaker's when he was
carries on and deepens. So in conclusion, in terms of music and education, the much, much quoted statement of the great American composer, conductor, sorry, Robert Shaw, remains one of the best summaries of the overall educational challenge, gift, and necessity of music, whether this is within a formal education setting or elsewhere. And I'll give you part of that quote, I'll give you a little bit more here. Shaw wrote, we believe that music is more a necessity than a luxury, not simply because it is therapeutic, nor because it is a universal language, but because it is the persistent focus of man's intelligence, aspiration, and goodwill. To be an artist is to arrive at some sort of resolution of the mind and matter struggle. There is no landscaped approach to beauty and truth. You scratch and scramble around intellectual granites, you try to diffuse or tether your, your emotional tantrums. You pray for the day when your intellect and your instinct can coexist. So that the brain need not, need not calcify the heart, nor the heart flood and drown all reason. But in that struggle lies the tolerable dignity and a tolerable destiny. To be an artist and convinced, again, why we're doing our program here, for instance, to be an artist is not the privilege of a few, but the necessity of us all. <coughs> I will say only a few words about music and worship. The question there becomes, how does music serve the liturgical needs of the service? The potential exists for music deeply to enrich the verbal dimension of our acts of worship. And it also allows worshipers to engage in ways that transcend the normal limits of language. Uh, I'm going to give a short example about uh, my own work in, with, with familiar texts. I think in worship, music can help us understand texts in, in uh, different and perhaps ways that are, are, are new to us or, or, or on, on unfold something in the text that we hadn't seen before. Um, hymns are particularly challenging musically because we have one bit of music that has to do with all of the verses of the poetry. So where something might be fitting for a particular verse, uh, it might not be fitting uh, at the same place in another verse. I'd like us to sing together, uh, please, hymn number 48. And uh, we will sing only verses 4 and 6. Hymn number 48. Uh, verse 4 is Dear Mother Earth, and verse 6 is And Thou Most Kind. I know those verses are really squished in there, but uh, 4 and 6, we can remember that, right? Uh, let's stand. <laughs>
Thank you. I did a setting of this text for, uh, some of you will know Henry Engbrecht's name, uh, Brecht's uh, longtime director at the University of Manitoba and uh, very well known in the Manitoba community is there. He's directed a uh, choir called the Faith and Life Male Choir for many years. Uh, he commissioned a piece for a good friend of his, Phil Enns, not, not related to me. Uh, Phil Enns is, uh, has made an opera career uh, and is, is a very, very fine singer. Um, so I did this, I did a study of this text, uh, and um, I want to play those two verses. Um, uh, Henry's wife, Erna, had just passed away, his first wife, and Phil Enns' mother had just passed away. So especially that sixth verse was, was very uh, poignant to me. Uh, so I, I tried to uh, <coughs> attend to the meaning of, of the words. And, uh, and this is so much the role of music in worship, is, is not unpacking even so much a single word as to attend to the meaning of the word the meaning of the text rather than the semantic definition or the definition of one particular text. So here's the very old thing, just so that you get the sort of sense. It's male choir, you know, and, and all that stuff. And then we'll go to the fourth and the sixth verse. Uh, yes. <laughs>
While music and worship often serves to deepen the meaning of the text, I think the most fundamental role of music and worship is as a kind of communion. Briefly, each worshiper engages with the others uh, in a visceral and potential way through the participation in communal song, and each worshiper may also enter into the presence of the divine through singing and listening to music and worship. My understanding of communion in its normal sense is that it is always a living out of the bi-directional stretch of the cross, a commitment to both neighbor and God. I'm proposing that congregational song may serve as communion that reaches in both ways to each other and to the divine. I'm going to talk just briefly about the second point. Music has the possibility of transcending the specifics of language and taking us to a point that is beyond the constraints of our verbally limited imagination. With our words and endless articles of faith and in our prescriptions and descriptions, I wonder, might we not actually be diminishing the divine source and ultimate home of our being? One wonders, is our God so small that words will do? both in our description and in our approach to the divine. Music can, help, can bring us, unfettered by verbal logic, into communion with God, binding creature and creator, soul and source. When rightly part of worship, it becomes a profound and direct contact with the divine. Hymn texts, I think, specify and channel the fire of this divine communion while the music of the hymns extends the reach of the texts and has the potential to bring us to God. If we only listen to music in worship, no matter how lovely, how refined, how ancient, how contemporary it might be, if we only listen to it, then the Reformation has not yet happened, and the curtain of the temple has not been torn open to allow us to enter the Holy of Holies. Without engaged hymn singing, we remain as observers rather than as participants. The special role of music and worship, particularly congregational song, is that it serves as a special kind of special, special, a special kind of communion, reflecting both of the reaches of the cross, communion with one another and communion with God. Congregational song brings a particular experience of communion from behind the screen where, where the, the choir, which was the monks who gathered and did communion, where the choir was, from behind the screen into the presence of the people. It is possibly the most visceral, sensual, and precious gift of the Reformation to worship. I'm going to end very briefly then with just a few comments about music in the public concert although I'll leave an in-depth exploration of this for my graying years. <laughs> I believe the public concert can be a setting for virtually all of the topics we have discussed, and at its best it combines education and spiritual and emotional. It may, but need not, include entertainment. Um, and I'm going to, I think we are probably facing a clock here pretty soon. Are we just, no? Okay. okay. I can keep going then. <laughs> um, it, it may, but need not include entertainment. Education will have an impact on the concert experience if the mutual relationship between liking, understanding, and appreciating is not specious, then we will appreciate the concert experience in greater and greater depth as we understand more and more about the music. In terms of the connection with worship, except for the occasional special situation, of course, listeners will not likely burst into song, but can be and often are transported in a concert setting in ways that are similar to what is experienced in worship. The public concert, ideally, offers an experience of transcendence, of positive challenge, and helps build the road to a more humane society. It can sensitize, dignify, pacify, challenge, and help create a vigorous, creative, positive community 
and a more noble society. I simply have no doubt about that. The public concert is a setting for catharsis, for the experience of spiritual aspiration, <clears throat> for lament, confession, hope, celebration. Ideally, as opposed to worship, the public concert is a setting blind to confessional and cultural preferences, though it remains a reality for choral musicians, especially that much of our repertoire arises from within the church. Think of all the masses that you've heard in public concert, um, or is somehow related to ecclesial liturgies. Suffice it to say then that the concert setting provides a rich context with the possibility of combining elements of education, spiritual and emotional engagement, and occasion of <coughs> entertainment. I, I say that because I had a bit of an argument with some who will uh, stand very solid on the rock of entertainment. And it, I, it, it, it has a place, but I don't think it's the reason, at least not for me. In summary, then, I am proposing that music has a rightful and uniquely fruitful place in education. I think it should be there much more systematically embedded into education at all levels. I think that if we taught our young people the arts and um, let some of the very technical courses to be learned on the job, we might have more humane uh, and hopeful and vigorous and rich society. Uh, music is a rightful and unique place in education. That music, secondly, becomes a type of communion in worship. Um, I believe many of us have experienced that, so I'm just saying, I think, what you know. And then in terms of the public concert, that in the, in the public concert, music has the potential for profound personal, social and spiritual benefit and experience. We will conclude then by returning to an example of music in worship. As I mentioned, one of the most effective roles of a choir in worship is as a vehicle for enhancing congregational song. I've written several hymn anthems, hymn concertados, whatever one wishes to call them, and you never seem to come up with a, a title or a the scripture that seems to make good sense. In all cases, the choir extends the hymn, allowing the congregation to hear a text in a new way, enhancing the singing of the congregation in various ways, and so on. None of this is new, but I find it rewarding and appropriate for worship. Uh, we're going to end by singing a setting of the hymn uh, For the Beauty of the Earth. It was commissioned by Waterloo North Mennonite Church to celebrate the 25th anniversary of that church in 2011. We're not going to sing How Can I Keep From Singing Today, uh, should you have thought that we were. <laughs> and that sentence makes sense to me today. Uh, however, should you wish to sing How Can I Keep From Singing, uh, come to the convocation service of the college uh, where it will be part of that ceremony. <laughs> So, we're going to end with For the Beauty of the Earth, uh, and I thank you very much for being here and enjoying me. Um, hymn number 89 in your hymn books, and let's stand. I will invite you in for your verses.
we always take a few minutes if people have comments, if they have a question or two, we'd like to do that for about five or eight minutes, and then we'll go to the reception and give you instructions for that. But I invite you if you have a comment to make. It's, uh, it's one of the great challenges sometimes after something like that for one's voice to speak a little bird. <laughs> What comes first, the words you use it? Most typically, I, I work from words. Um, for example, uh, well, both, say, both Nocturne, the, the night sky thing, and, and uh, the silver cord. Uh, I mean, I think probably I was just reading memorizing the texts probably for a month or something before I would start writing. Usually it's the, the words. I mean, the, the words have to speak to you, I think. Uh, I, I've had the really good fortune in the last 10 years, I think, to, to have made a connection with a wonderful uh, poet in British Columbia, uh, a dear friend, Martin McCarthy, at the University of Guelph Commission. Commission of Peace from you. I, it must be 10, anyway, some years ago, for her women's choir. And she sang me a book called uh, uh, Poetry and Spiritual Practice, which had a, a number of wonderful poems in them. Uh, two poems by George Whipple. And uh, I said, some of the singers will know uh, Sparrow. I said that poem uh, by him. And, and then was in touch with him, of course, to get permission to use the poem and so on. And, and we've, we've established a really wonderful, uh, it's kind of like a pen pal relationship. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen him, except that he sent me sort of a blurry picture of himself in, in, in his old folks' home room. I mean, he's quite, quite advanced in years. Uh, he doesn't have telephone or email, and uh, the only communication is, is by Canada Post, like the old Canada Post, not the trucks that say e stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's words. Usually it's not always, not always, 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 but usually it's words. Okay. I mentioned before about the gift that I was given to a lot of us on faculty introducing us to poets. Eric Whipple is, is one. I was looking at my website today and I was thinking about this event. And we'll look on look up Eric. George, 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 sorry. And uh, Eric Whipple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and look at even the title of some of the books, uh, poetry collections, they're, they're, they're marvelous, marvelous use of language. Yes. Another comment, and then I'll give you instructions about where we will go next to the talk with them. Let me then tell you about the event that Len was uh, mentioning. Um, next Sunday afternoon, not this week, but following on the 21st, we will have our annual convocation ceremony. It's on this campus. It's in the Theater of the Arts and then the reception back here at Grable. It's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So the undergraduates and the graduates are honored. And this year particularly, uh, with Landon retiring, the, the chamber choir will be singing as well. And there you will have a chance to probably sing along. You will have a chance to sing along with this. How can I keep them singing? How can you actually have that song there and not allow people to sing along? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think he just said that, didn't he, before I got work? So, that's one event. And so, we welcome you to that. It's always a highlight in our, in our year. It's a time of great celebration. So, please join us. Maybe you're celebrating your own graduation, uh, family members' graduation. So, we'd love to have you come. You will see another event on the back of this, which is when they'll have a chance to hear Len and the Chamber Choir one more time. A quite remarkable event um, at the end of the month. And uh, you'll see the instructions here, at, you'll see the information about the Sharon Temple. Uh, 
Um, you can look it up and find it on the website and find the instructions. It's in the Markham area. Apparently, it's a remarkable acoustical place. And it's quite a privilege to be able to get in there, to be able to sing and listen to music. So uh, I would highly commend that to you. Uh, I think it would be a marvelous, marvelous concert. And maybe one of the few times you can actually get in there to hear some music. I don't know how often there are public events there, but apparently it's quite marvelous. And then if you look, there are a series of other things. This is a very, very busy, active community. We have lectureships, we have concerts. And uh, you see there are also just, just on the cusp of our 50th anniversary year. And so this next year will be filled with all sorts of events. And uh, you see the beginning of that uh, being indicated at the bottom of this page. Um, just think, uh, 50 years of this college being here on this campus, not quite 50 years in the actual building, uh, but uh, a, a really a remarkable history. And so we invite you to join us for many, many of those events. But for now, before we go and have the reception, which will be down the stairs outside the chapel, down, keep going all the way down to the basement, follow it along, there's a lower atrium area, and there's a reception set up, and there are in fact some CDs there, and uh, so you'd be welcome to, to purchase those and, and to talk to Len. But uh, before we head that way, Len, again, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much, I think.